All right. Good afternoon, everyone. The Secretary General is in Brussels, where today he attended a session with the members of the European Council, which included a working lunch. Before the session, in a joint press encounter with the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, the Secretary General said that the visit to Brussels demonstrates the excellent cooperation between the European Union and the United Nations. The Secretary General warned that we have a perfect storm in many developing countries and a combination of factors that lead to a very dramatic situation. He noted that sustainable development goals are moving backwards and there's more hunger, more poverty, less education, and fewer health services in so many parts of the world. He added that it is clear that our international financial system is not fit for purpose to deal with such a huge challenge. And we very much count on the European Union to lead the transformations that are necessary in order to be able to put the 2030 agenda back on track. The Secretary General added, following the last report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that we need dramatic action. We've issued a readout of his meeting with the members of the European Council, saying that it offered a timely opportunity to discuss pressing global matters, including the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its far-reaching consequences, the climate emergency, and growing global inequalities. The readout asked that the Secretary General discuss the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, stressing his call for just peace in line with the UN Charter, international law, and the resolution adopted by the General Assembly on the 23rd of February. The Secretary General is announcing today the appointment of José Moreira da Silva of Portugal as Executive Director of the United Nations Office for Project Services, UNOPS. The Secretary General wishes to extend his appreciation and gratitude to Jens Wandel of Denmark for his service as Acting Executive Director. Mr. Moreira da Silva is currently a visiting full professor at the Faculty of Engineering of Oporto University and adjunct professor at the Paris School of International Affairs. He was most recently director of the Development Cooperation Directorate of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We have more details in a bio note. Thank you. This morning, Geir Peterson, our special envoy to Syria, told members of the Security Council that the situation today is so unprecedented that it calls for leadership, bold ideas, and a cooperative spirit. He added that a political solution is the only way forward for Syria, and this may not be reached in one step, but he believes we can progress towards it gradually. For his part, Tarek Talama, the acting director of the Operations and Advocacy Division in the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, spoke about the immense needs, especially after the earthquakes. He pointed out that these needs will require continued resolve from the international community and that further action is required to create a more enabling environment one where humanitarian assistance can reach communities in a safe, predictable, and timely fashion. Speaking of which, we have a quick update from our humanitarian colleagues on the response to the earthquakes in Syria. On the health front, humanitarian workers have vaccinated some 1.7 million people against cholera during a 10-day vaccination campaign in northwest Syria. More than 235,000 people have received access to water and sanitation after some water infrastructure was fixed in some parts of the country. In areas under government control, our partners have assessed thousands of schools for safety and structural integrity and have started conducting light rehabilitation in some of the affected areas. They've also provided recreational kits, early childhood education kits, heaters and stationery to over 2,800 girls and boys in collective shelters and schools. Our humanitarian colleagues also note that torrential rains have impacted displacement sites in northwest and northeast Syria. We and our humanitarian partners are assessing needs and responding accordingly, including by replacing damaged shelters. Our colleagues in the UN mission in South Sudan say they have initiated steps to help the country address potential challenges from the onset of this year's rainy season. As South Sudan has witnessed unprecedented, unprecedented flooding in recent years, UNMIS has started maintaining vital dikes to pr protect civilians and their properties from floodwaters in places like Bintiu in Unity State. In Jongle State and other parts of the country where there are tremendous mobility challenges in the rainy season, UNMIS peacekeepers are using all-terrain vehicles to navigate difficult territory and, if needed, support the delivery of humanitarian aid to areas inaccessible due to floods. 
Further on, the earthquakes that struck Afghanistan and the region on Tuesday, our humanitarian office has deployed teams to support relief efforts and assessments, which are still ongoing. They've received reports of five people killed and 55 injured, with more than 900 houses destroyed or damaged. Our assessment efforts continue, and the numbers could rise. In Haiti, a new analysis of the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, better known as the IPC, was published this morning. This analysis shows a steady increase in the number of people facing food insecurity in the country. Nearly half the population, 4.9 million people, are now struggling to feed themselves. According to this analysis, 1.8 million people are estimated to be in emergency IPC Phase 4, up from 1.7 million people in September last year. The areas most affected are Cité Soleil and the town of Jeremy on Haiti's southern peninsula. However, one slight improvement to note is that increased human humanitarian food assistance in Cité Soleil pulled the most vulnerable people from Phase 5, which is catastrophic food insecurity, down into lower phases. Our WFP colleagues in Haiti stress that it is critical to continue life-saving food assistance for the most vulnerable Haitians and to con continue to prioritize resilience and safety net initiatives to address the root causes of hunger, and they're calling for support. In Colombia, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that there's been a rise in the number of people affected by clashes, with 7.7 .7 million people in need of assistance. Afro-Colombian and indigenous communities are facing increased protection risks. In the first three months of 2023, more than 25,000 people have been newly displaced or forcibly confined due to violence. Despite indigenous people representing only 4% of Colombia's population, they comprised more than 40% of the people affected by humanitarian emergencies of mass displacement and confinement in 2022. We and the government have jointly launched a humanitarian response plan to reach 1.6 million people, mostly women, children, people with disabilities, indigenous people, and others. Today is World Meteorological Day. In his message for the day, the Secretary General said that humanity faces a difficult truth, which is that climate change is making our planet uninhabitable. He added that this year's theme, the future of weather, climate, and water across generations, compels us all to live, to our responsibility, to live up to our responsibilities and ensure that future generations inherit a better tomorrow. And for briefings, today at 1.15 p.m., there will be a briefing here with David Cooper, the Acting Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and Dr. Musunda Mumba, the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. They will brief journalists on the coordinated manner in which the two conventions will work to implement the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and the Ramsar Strategic Plan. Then tomorrow at 10 a.m., there will be a hybrid briefing by the chair of the Com Commission on the Status of Women, 67, Ambassador Matu Joyini, permanent representative of South Africa to the United Nations. And then at noon, I will be joined here by the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Li Junhua, who will brief us on the closing of the 2023 Water Conference. And last, we would like to say thank you to our friends in Jamaica for paying their regular budget dues in full. This brings the number of fully paid up member states to 79. Okay, James. Thank you, Farhan. Um, so the visit of President Xi to Moscow to meet President Putin has concluded. What is the Secretary General's reaction with regard to the war in Ukraine? Does he think it in any way brings us closer to peace? It's, it's as, as historians sometimes say, too soon to tell. Obviously, we are supportive of all efforts that encourage dialogue, and, uh, and therefore uh, we support any progress towards dialogue from any parties. Uh, at, at this point, as you know, our emphasis is uh, on uh, creating the conditions for a just peace in line with the UN Charter, international law, and the resolution adopted on the 23rd of February by the General Assembly. And can I just raise that our colleagues in Brussels noted that the Secretary General came and spoke to reporters and simply gave a statement and didn't take any questions. I mean, surely interaction with the press is part of the Secretary General's job. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I'm sorry that uh, he was not able to uh, do that. Uh, this was a very quick uh, meeting. He did have to head uh, to that. Uh, we had initially thought he was going to take a few questions, but uh, he was not able to. And he will be heading back uh, to New York shortly. Well, He's, we're the, we're, the he, we're here awaiting tonight. him if he wants to take the questions here. 
uh, we, we'll we'll run that by him. I, I I believe sometime in the near future we'll see what we can do to to bring him uh, to uh, you in the press. Yes, uh, Nick Hosser from Volant Media. Uh, how does the UN measure the impact of this UN Water Conference? Uh, certainly, it's it's very positive that uh, the member states are trying to work with each other to address uh, their situation uh, in terms of the need for clean water, the need for uh, adequate sanitation facilities around the world, uh, the preservation of the wetlands, which is something uh, some uh, of the speakers in this afternoon will talk to you about. Uh, you'll get more from uh, uh, Under Secretary General Lee tomorrow, but, uh, but uh, this has been a positive set of discussions and we hope we'll get some productive results from it. Uh, yes, Gregory. Uh, thank you very much, Farhan. Uh, uh, does the UN uh, see any progress uh, on the issue of the uh, of, uh, export of Russian food and fertilizer uh, uh, due to outcomes the Secretary General visit to Brussels? And the second one, please. Uh, did the Secretary discuss uh, the issue of the uh, export of Belarusian fertilizers? Thank you. Uh, I don't have anything beyond the fairly extensive, a uh, fairly lengthy readout of that meeting that we shared with you. So I would just refer you to that. Uh, but regarding the situation of uh, Russian uh, exports, obviously we are encouraging that uh, and, and we do this in a variety of venues, the Secretary General is doing. And uh, so is Rebecca Greenspan, the Secretary General of UNCTAD, as she continues with her contacts. And uh, there's no uh, major developments to tell you about that today, but uh, certainly we'll, we're keeping uh, <laughs> our efforts going and, and we'll continue to push ahead and try to get some real progress on this. Yes, uh, Deshi. First, a quick question on Nord Stream. Uh, has the UN recently had any contact with relative parties about the, a potential investigation from the UN on the Nord Stream? No, I, d I don't believe that uh, anything like that is envisioned as matters currently stand. Okay, so my question is on the water conference. Uh, we know that uh, there's supposed to be a water action agenda as the, um, as the outcome of this conference. Uh, what's, what's Secretary General's expectation on this agenda since it's not a treaty or declaration but a outcome a document? Well, not, not everything that we do results in treaties. Uh, if we can get an action agenda that the member states commit to, and if they're willing to live up to that agenda and implement it, uh, that would be a big step forward. Uh, beyond uh, that, uh, I would just refer you to what the Secretary General said yesterday in terms of the specific things he believes uh, the, the member states need to engage in. Yeah, one last question. Um, we know that the UN has been long addressing the, the issue of disinformation and others on the social media platform. Uh, you, you just mentioned about what yesterday SG's, talk, uh, SG's remarks on the water conference. Um, our colleague in, in CGT in Europe, they posted a video of SG's remark yesterday without adding anything, got removed by TikTok. Said this, this video violates our community guidelines disinformation misled or any any of our community members endangers our trust based community uh, i mean how how would how would the un tell everybody that the water conference and what secretary general's words about this um, what it called a uh, vampiric overconsumption of uh, is draining the world's water is very important and vital Maybe you should share this with the with the company TikTok and other people. Well, we we shared this message widely, uh, and uh, certainly I would vouch for the accuracy of the information that we put out, uh, including in our reports and the remarks of the Secretary General. Yeah, I, I just checked. It's just the video of the Secretary General. There's nothing, uh, and it I, got removed. I I believe that that's really a question for TikTok to answer in terms of how they how they go about this. Uh, yes, uh, Majid. Thank you, Farhan. I have two questions. The first one is uh, um, on uh, reports that Syria and Saudi Arabia are uh, uh, basically uh, reopening their embassies after more than a decade of, of uh, cut off ties, and they are reestablishing diplomatic relationships. What is the UN's reaction to this? Uh, 
I believe that uh, Gary Peterson, as, as you know, has briefed the Security Council, including on what the latest developments are. If there is any way that the recent developments, which, as you know, he called unprecedented, can open up the way for some productive diplomacy to put a final end to the conflict in Syria, that that would be a positive outcome of, of what's been happening. Does the Secretary General think that the reestablishment of the relationship between Arab countries and the Syrian government and Assad is a positive development? We don't govern bilateral relations. Those are the matter of sovereign nations dealing with each other. Mm -hmm. Our hope is that any nations dealing with Syria will encourage all efforts towards a final and peaceful resolution of the conflict. And the second question is on the water conference. Is, I, I want to uh, understand, is this, w will this conference become like a periodic conference? Is there plans for this to happen annually or, or this is something? No. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not an annual conference, but mm -hmm. certainly yeah. in terms of follow-up. No, moving ahead. Yeah. Uh, in terms of follow-up and moving ahead, I, I'd beg your indulgence to hear from uh, Under Secretary General Lee, who will um, who will talk to you about this at tomorrow's noon briefing. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Ephraim. Hi, Farhan. I also have two uh, questions. The first one on Syria. Ger Pedersen today uh, reiterated the Secretary General's call uh, for the General Assembly to consider establishing a new international body to clarify and address the issue of the missing and the detainees. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's any progress on that front and where we're at right now. Uh, we are pushing ahead with this efforts, and in fact, I believe next week, next Tuesday, in fact, there will be a meeting uh, of the General Assembly to deal with this issue, and you'll be able to hear from both the Secretary General and from the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and so we'll, uh, we'll have some more to contribute at that point. Okay, thank you. The second question is on Lebanon. Another warning from the IMF today in Beirut. Uh, the mission, uh, the head of the mission of the IMF seems to be shocked once again that the Lebanese authorities have not implemented any of the reforms that they committed to last year. Uh, and everyone knows the dire situation there. And um, the IMF was warning again that the situation is about to get worse. Um, so for um, a group of... Um, the, the authority, is there any way the Secretary General or the UN uh, can tell these authorities or make them understand how important the reforms are or just say something? Or, because we, apparently we, we, it's we falling have, on deaf ears. We have underscored this many times and our special coordinator on the ground, Joanna Vronetska, has uh, made clear to all our interlocutors the need to press ahead with reforms. This is yet another reason why there needs to be uh, a functional government uh, in place in Lebanon that can take the necessary steps, including the necessary fiscal and monetary f reforms to put the country back on track. Uh, Margaret Bashir. Farhan, um, also on Syria, please. Uh, the uh, two additional border crossings that were opened after the earthquake uh, they were opened for an initial period of about uh, of three months, and we're about halfway through that three months. So I'm wondering, uh, is it the UN's intention to renew it at the end of those three months? And was that part of Mr. Griffith's discussions yesterday with President Assad? Oh, well, this is, of course, an agreement reached with the government of Syria, and we'll see what we can do. What we have emphasized is the need to have as many border crossings open as possible to get as much aid as we can in, and we'll continue with those efforts uh, and see uh, whether we can uh, keep uh, these crossing points open for a lengthier period of time. Uh, so Oscar. To, to, sorry, Farhan, yeah. the follow-up? Yeah. So, in other words, to extend it beyond the three months, um, it, it would need a decision, obviously, from the Syrian government, but with the UN, like in a bilateral way, or it's a unilateral yes or no from Syria. I mean, I'm not sure how you see it. Uh, we're we're dealing with our Syrian counterparts to see what can be done. Ultimately, uh, you you saw what the agreement was uh, from the government side, and we'll see whether that can be extended further. Um, Oscar Bolaños. Yes. Hi, Farhan. Um, my question to follow up yesterday, um, the situation in Haiti. Um, 
what is the um, really this uh, the call for uh, international force to intervene in Haiti? Can you elaborate more about in details if the UN would be part of this uh, call of international uh, force in Haiti? Uh, no, I mean, uh, you, you've seen what the proposals have been. Uh, we are seeing uh, whether uh, member states will step up and uh, take up their responsibilities. And uh, as you've seen, the Secretary General and the officials of our mission, Binu, have, uh, have encouraged them to do so. Uh, if the car and to follow up, I'm sorry. Yes, to follow up on that, uh, on those regards, why the UN is not being part of this when uh, we know that this uh, escalation of violence and everything uh, as up to now in Haiti, it's been happening since the earthquake in 2010, and you know the social, political, economical situation in Haiti is being degraded day by day. Uh, well, you're aware of the discussions that have t taken place in the Security Council and the exchange between the Security Council uh, and the Secretary General on this, so I just refer you back to that. Uh, Iftikhar? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Farhan. My question about water conference has been asked, but there is one point. This, this, uh, a number of delegates have called for appointment of a, a Secretary General's special representative on water, uh, does this is this proposal being considered by the Secretary General? We'll consider all of the various proposals uh, that are being discussed here. But again, I'd beg your indulgence for when Mr. Lee can talk to you about uh, uh, about the wrap up of of the water conference events tomorrow. Uh, Deji and then James. Uh, two questions on Syria. First, uh, how's the cross line uh, uh, operation now? Uh, it's it's been difficult. Uh, there there was uh, one uh, example of cross line aid uh, that happened a few weeks ago to the Talaba to that's, the Talabia the the Rasaline area. That's not but, northwest. But 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 yes, uh, uh, providing cross line aid to northwest Syria has been more difficult. So we're w using cross border area of uh, convoys instead. Uh, second. Uh, there's there was a, an airstrike on Aleppo International Airport again on Wednesday. Um, Syrian media outlet accused Israel conducted this air raid. So any response from from the Secretary General on this because this is the second time. Uh, yeah, what I can say about that is that the Secretary General is concerned about the reported strikes on Aleppo International Airport. Uh, those resulted in material damage and airport closure, including the cancellation of uh, one UN humanitarian air service flight. Uh, so the Secretary General reminds all parties to respect their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law as applicable. He also repeats his call on all concerned to avoid attacks that could harm civilians and damage civilian infrastructure. Yes, James. Uh, yes. So um, first, just checking, you mentioned the Syria detainee meeting next Tuesday in the GA, in which you said the Secretary General will be speaking. You also said the High Commissioner for Human Rights will be speaking. Is High Commissioner Turk in New York? Uh, he will be in New York uh, tomorrow, uh, next Tuesday for, for this meeting, yes. And he, he'll be in New York for some time? He could speak to the press? No. Unfortunately, uh, we actually did ask him. He was willing to speak to the press, but his schedule is extremely tight, so I don't know whether that's going to happen. I don't believe it will, so it might have to be a time when it, he it has would be good, It would be good if he could talk to us. I think it's his first visit, or one that we're aware of, since he's had the job, and it would be good for him to introduce himself in this role to the press corps, and there are quite pressing questions on human rights. We'll see what's possible, but as I understand it, he has his flight back out of, uh, out of uh, New York immediately after the... the um, we're happy uh, to talk meeting. to him before. We'll see what's possible. Okay. Uh, right, other questions. Um, moving to India, and the leader, the opposition leader, leader of the Congress Party, Rahul Gandhi, has been sentenced to two years in prison. His party say it's politically motivated. Is the Secretary General worried about that and about democracy in India? Uh, I can say that we're aware of the reports regarding the case of Rahul Gandhi. We understand that his, uh, that his party does plan to appeal the decision. Uh, that's as much as I can say on and, that. And on the this, end this of stage. the water conference, you keep referring us to Mr. Lee. 
um, who will be speaking to tomorrow, and we will attend and listen to him. But he has other responsibilities other than just water. And there are many at this conference calling for the UN to have a point person, a water czar, a UN water special envoy. Is that something the Secretary General supports? Uh, that, that is something that is being considered. I don't have any announcement to make at this stage. Uh, sorry, there's so many more questions. Uh, back to Margaret Bashir. Farhan, sorry, one, one more follow-up on Syria. Um, the OCHA rep at the meeting, uh, Mr. Talama, he, he didn't explicitly call for the two additional border crossings to be extended beyond mid-May. So is, is that, does that mean they don't need them to be? Is that something that's not necessary? Well, we'll see. I mean, this is something that's still under discussions. Obviously, we're a ways away from uh, the end of the current uh, mandate to use these um, to use these crossing points, but we'll see uh, what the needs are. But the discussions are continuing. Uh, ideally, we want to make sure that border crossings are open as long as we need them, and uh, and we'll keep the discussions up. Uh, Sylvian Zahil. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, I'm. I'm, uh, uh, the, the question is on Lebanon and the the United Nations action in Lebanon vis-à-vis -vis the Syrian refugee. There is a catastrophe in the making on the way of the United Nations under the cover of humanitarian action has been actively contributing forever this in forever discovering disfiguring the Lebanese demographics and undermining indigenous stability and social fabric. Is it how can you respond, uh, respond to this uh, critic? Uh, I don't think I have anything it's more to acceptable. add than what I answer, said in answer to what Ephraim was asking earlier on this. Uh, uh, Majid no, this and is... then Ephraim. Majid, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Farhan. This is on Syria. Human Rights Watch uh, reports that um, three members of a fraction belonging to the Turkish-backed Syrian National Army, which is a jihadi group in north uh, of Syria opened fire on a Kurdish family during Nowruz celebration and killed more than three people. And in the same report by Human Rights Watch, if you bear with me, it says Turkey has allowed these fighters to abuse people living in these areas under their control with impunity. This is a systematic issue for five years, according to Human Rights Watch. These Turkish-backed jihadi groups open fire on people, sometimes abduct them. Uh, an incident like this is just one of the examples what is the reaction of the United Nations about this? And since UN is very active in North Syria through their humanitarian partners, is there, uh, is there something you can tell us about what's happening there, especially recently? Well, we deplore all that attacks by any faction on civilians uh, in Syria, and we uh, call for them to stop. Uh, all, all such uh, attacks must be thoroughly uh, investigated. Yes, Ephraim. Just a general question I've been meaning to ask you it, uh, for the past couple of days. Why has there not been a water conference for half a century? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know why it hadn't happened up until now, but we're certainly glad that it is happening now. It takes time for member states to recognize the seriousness of some of the problems we face, and at least they're doing this, and it's, it's a positive development. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Ephraim. Um, I have a question. Javid Rehman, the special rapporteur for Iran, um, had a briefing, and um, he talked about his uh, latest report on uh, human rights in Iran. Um, after the release of the report, the um, Islamic Republic um, uh, accused him of not being impartial, and his report is not um, impartial. Uh, what is the Secretary General has to say um, regarding to that matter? Thank you. Uh, well, we don't, as a, as a matter of principle, comment uh, extensively on the work of special rapporteurs who are independent of the Secretary General, but we do stand by uh, the integrity and the impartiality of their work. Have a good afternoon, everyone. We'll see you again tomorrow.